Welcome to this edition of the Agronomist. Thank you so much for <laughs> joining me. I'm I'm should probably get my composure before the camera comes up, but uh, loving all the comments already. So good evening, everyone. I am Lindsay Smith. I am your host. Hello to John, who of course welcomed everyone, and hats off to Scott Gillespie, who already has a question in the chat. So yes, <laughs> that is how the Agronomist work. Please ask your questions. Um, we can cover all sorts of different topics. And um, I guess who I'm about to bring in, if they don't want to answer it, probably someone else in the chat will. So that's how this works. We all get to learn together. Um, and I believe the term, John, you were looking for was a Chinook. It is very warm out in Alberta and producer Jay can attest to that um, and very windy. So we're probably going to talk a little bit about that. But before we do that, of course, we have a few housekeeping items. Uh, so for anyone who collects CEU credits, you do qualify for hanging out here tonight with us. So please head on over to realagriculture.com slash agronomists to let us know that you did watch and to get to your information in there. And this show is brought to you by Adama Canada. We're all in on you and yes also real egg radio and mind your farm business so thank you to adam and canada our show sponsors real egg radio and mind your farm business all right oh, this is a good one i'm excited so tonight's discussion is all about compaction so how to avoid it how to gauge just how bad it is how much it costs and then of course what, if anything, you can do about it. And so to discuss, I bring in two fantastic guests. Jody Dijon Hughes is here and Ian McDonald. Welcome, Jody. Welcome, Ian. Thanks for having me. All right. Okay, so I am I'm pretty excited. I won't lie. I'm hopeful we're gonna have some really interesting questions that come in. Before we get to all that and to some of some of the topics and things we want to cover tonight, Jody, you uh, so you're with you're an extension specialist with the University of Minnesota. Last week you also ran an entire conference on soil compaction. Mm -hmm. How did it go? It, it went really well. Um, I had a good team that knows how to do technology, so I don't have to. <laughs> that is very key. <laughs> that is absolutely key. Now, what were some of the the biggest topics, biggest discussion points from last week? Oh, wow. It's kind of hard to, to pick. Um, you know, tracks versus tires is always a big one. Um, yeah. Just knowing, uh, using cover crops to break up compaction instead of always using iron. Um, just what is compaction and how does it work and what are all the factors and why should I worry? Because, you know, you can get anywhere from what, zero to a 60% yield decrease. So that's kind of a wide range and yeah. 
Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I, I, unfortunately, we don't have a tracks versus tires whole segment. That probably should be one whole show. I'll be honest, because that seems to be a pretty, uh, pretty large uh, topic for discussion. So it, it will probably come up a few times. Uh, now, Ian, you're with Omafra. You're a crop innovation specialist, which I think is a fantastic title. Um, I think we're just going to rename it like robot specialist. But anyway, but Ian, you've been and we're going to talk about this event a few times. But you have you are part of sort of the compaction team here in Ontario. Um, what has that looked like this past year? Well, I guess now two years, two summers, I suppose. What has this work looked like for your team? So the team is composed of some government people, uh, some academics, um, a bunch of industry guys like tire guys and uh, uh, central tire inflation system guys, and uh, some really top-notch farmers. And we sort of have that group advises us, and then there's a smaller group um, who are the worker bees and we go out and do the events and stuff. So um, this past year, uh, we actually hosted the North American Manure Expo here in Ontario back in uh, the end of August, although we did the work in early August. And uh, we did, I've got a chart that I'm going to show you from some of the results from that uh, later on in our discussion here this evening. So um, yeah, it was great to be able to get out and actually work with people. Um, and and do some practical stuff and we did some neat stuff this year in that we for the first time in this work that we've been doing we did a dry pit versus a wet pit to show the difference between what might happen after wheat versus what might happen in early spring or late fall when the weather conditions sort of deteriorate and that was really interesting light bulb moments oh i like those i hope you i hope you're going to share some i also realized we color coordinated quite well team um, so I'm, I'm quite impressed with us actually. Okay. We'll, we'll pretend like we planned that. All right. Okay. So now, um, oh, here we go already. Patrick Berkeley is on any CTI. I'm going with central tire inflation, right? Did I get that correct? For a loader tractor with now I'm guessing he's saying now blasted tires. I'm guessing he, he does not mean blasted <laughs> tires. I'm going to guess he means either ballasted. ballasted Wow. Yeah, that yeah. I'm going with. Sorry, Patrick, I'll correct that for you. So CTI options for a loader tractor with ballasted tires. Do either of you have any thoughts on that one? Um, yes, you could do it. Does it make sense? I guess with CTIS systems, I find that there's two ways to do it. You can put the system on the implement and then it's restricted only to the implement. I like to encourage people to put the system on a power unit like a tractor because then you can hook it up to multiple units for significantly less price per per unit extra um so in that way you could do a loader tractor um absolutely loader tractors for the most part are not well configured to reduce compaction um so when you get you know a, a row crop tractor out in the middle of the field when it's been wet and you're trying to pick up big square bales or round bales uh, you can do some damage with that front end when you put a thousand pounds or more on the front. So um, ballasted, I don't know. That's a question I don't know. Can the system work with ballasted tires? Um, I'd have to check on that, Patrick. All right, Patrick, we will get back to you. Jody, there's a question right off the hop here with Scott, who also wants to talk about all the wind erosion that's happening right now out, out west. Um, my colleague, Kara Oosterhouse, is out at Bow Island, and she sent a video today, and the wind is howling, and even even zero-till fields are blowing. It's pretty bad. Um, but Scott wants to know, so Jody, you did mention last week the discussion on cover crops, the potential for breaking up compaction, how much above ground growth indicates that we have roots deep enough to break to break up deep compaction. That sounds well, like a million well, dollar question, Jody. Yeah, if I knew that, I'd be doing really good. So, yeah. Um, yeah, it depends if you. Okay, and you're going to learn that the university answer is it depends. Um, right. If they're putting in tillage radish or some sort of radish in something with a really strong tap root, um, that can get up and going pretty quickly, and it's just but it can hit a compacted layer. It takes a little while for it to get through it. Uh, then you have like the, the um, clovers and everything, and, and that's more of a fibrous root system. And that mainly breaks up the surface compaction, but it won't get to your plow pans and it really won't do much for ruts. So 
cover crop is not necessarily going to solve a plow pan. No, not unless you, and it also depends how long you keep it in there. If you can keep right. it in there for yep. a while, and it depends how deep, <laughs> it depends uh, how deep that <laughs> layer is. Um, right. You know, I, I would, if you had cattle and you could do alfalfa for three years, but then you also track the alfalfa a lot. So you got to watch that too. But mm-hmm. alfalfa is really Jody, good at breaking up compaction. Jody, but, you've already brought grazing or forages <laughs> into the discussion, <laughs> like 10 minutes in. Like you actually, you might get an award <laughs> because usually it's me who has to remind everyone of animals and grazing and manure, but you have already brought them in. Thank you. Mm-hmm. Also, we really should have all extension and academics and university types should all have a shirt that says it depends. You should all mm-hmm. just have that and just wear it and then just point to your shirt. Um, or, no, but or, I, it's I, or it's complicated. Or it's complicated, exactly. How much, how much time do you have? That's why we do these shows every week. There's always more to talk about. Okay, so John has a really good question. And I, I'm not going to ask it just yet. Because first, Ian, I want to go to your slides. Because I think part of what's on those slides is what's going to in is going to demonstrate some of, I think, what we're going to tackle in John's question. So, John, just hold before we talk compaction of getting that corn off the field. So Ian, walk us through sort of, this is our intro to how compaction happens and and sort of the factors that make it worse, less worse, those sorts of fun things. So we started our journey in about uh, 2015, 2016 on compaction here in Ontario. And our growers have really taken to this. Uh, We've had some really neat field events that have been sort of eye opener, light bulb moments and stuff. And one of the things that I don't get very much anymore is sort of what causes compaction, because um, prior to us doing this little adventure, uh, we kind of looked at each other and goes, you know, like, why does it happen to us? How how come we're getting compaction? And uh, some of the guys didn't like it when I sort of came out with this idea. But I really think it's important for us to recognize that we do compaction to ourselves and in recognizing that it's a management decision and it should be managed like any other risk part of of the production system uh, we make these choices and in making those choices we improve or make worse the potential for the compaction the ability to get out of compaction and everything and so a lot of the questions um change when you all of a sudden it's 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 my fault so if you go to the second slide there jason so you know all of these types of things and many more are decisions that we make on an annual basis or a daily basis or whatever in terms of what we do in that field and all of those whether they are sort of long-term things or short-term things contribute to our susceptibility to compassion and so now that i have to think about it as it's my responsibility I look at it a little bit differently, right? And so from all the work that we've been doing, Jason, if you go to the third slide, um, you know, people ask, what can you do about compaction? And there's lots of things that you can do about compaction. And here's sort of 14 of them that we have. And I don't think, like, I don't have them up here in terms of the priority, like number one is not better than number 11 for instance but you know the more you can do of these the better some of them are much more long term like build better soils is a long term thing uh making less passes number 9 is a decision of the year type of thing but in recognizing that we can do things about it it better equips us to address the problem so that's what i wanted to sort of start with all right okay so that brings us to and Jody, I can't wait to hear your answer on this too. So John, John has painted a scenario and it's one that I think probably several Ontario farmers faced this fall. And that is he's got corn in the field, it's dry, but the ground's wet and he's fighting the weather and it's getting late. He already gave up buggies in the field cause that wasn't working cause it was a mess. So what's the mm-hmm. best way to get the corn to the approach? Do you make a lot of of tracks and use a different track every time? Or do you make one track and compact the snot out of it? Which is a technical term. I'll have everyone. Yes. Yes. So Jody, Jody, I'll start with you. Do you make lots of tracks or one bad track? 
Uh, one bad track as long as you're not slipping. Yeah, it does depend. I was going to say that and I thought it's already getting old. So I didn't know. <laughs> I'll be saying it the whole time. Um, so 80% uh, of your compaction can happen on the first pass. So if you move your tractor over or the combine over, you're doing 80% compaction all the way across. And if you can keep that one track, I mean, that's the whole concept for controlled traffic farming is, you know, compact the snot out of that one set and then stay off the rest. But your headlands are already compacted. So, mm -hmm. um, but yeah, unless you're writing things up and you can't get traction in there anymore, you're gonna have to move over. Okay, mm -hmm. Ian, do you agree, disagree? I don't disagree, but uh -oh. it, it really does depend. Um, <laughs> you know, if I buy Brent's new 2596 um, buggy with tracks, it'll carry 94 tons of stuff. And so how do I, how do I control that, you know, displacement of mass onto the field? Um, people don't like my answers and, and I get it. It doesn't fit into logistics, but in recognizing that maybe it helps people think about it. Um, you know, if you're loading on the go and you're filling that buggy up all the time under poor soil conditions, you're going to have compaction if you've got a big buggy or if you've got a small buggy with not enough rubber under it. Right. And so when you get into bad mm -hmm. conditions, recognizing it takes longer and everything, don't fill the buggy, use, use a less full buggy, get it to the field edges to the, feed the trucks. Yes. It's going to make more time, et cetera, but you're going to do far less damage. Whether you come back on all the tracks and stuff, like Jody was saying, it depends on how heavy is that wagon, how much rubber is underneath it. And are you willing to give that up and, and keep that given up? The problem is, is if I make this track this part of a season and I pick another place in the field to have a track, a different track the next season, I'm just contributing to the problem. In, in controlled traffic farming, you're always on the same spot. So if you can keep that from year to year, maybe that's the way to go and just give up that. But a lot of, dis, a lot of thought has to go into that decision. How big is the buggy? How big is the combine? How long are the fields? What are the yields like? You know, how do I feed that equipment across the landscape without doing huge amounts of damage? Mm -hmm. And I would just like to state for all our Western friends, a buggy is a grain cart. Just so you know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I was yeah sorry. A horse and buggy, and I'm like, are there? Yeah, a lot of not Amish the horse and buggy. Here? It's a grain okay. cart. Okay, and <laughs> okay. they do make so, but they. Grain carts now come in behemoth sizes. So oh, God, yes, yeah. they do they yeah, they do come with tracks. So we do have some, you know, we're starting to address some of that, but there some of them are huge. John calls it an auger cart. Yeah. Where is John from? I don't think so. Anyway, <laughs> that's that So if you have a two thousand bushel cart and yeah. you're putting down seventy five tassel load, it doesn't matter if you have tracks or tires exactly you're comp you're making compaction and you're making heavy duty compaction with that we kind of have like a rule of thumb that. yeah about every ten thousand pounds sorry you'll have to convert for me um goes about a foot or a third of a meter into the soil um that's kind of how we figure it so when you're at 40 ton and axle load you have the potential to go three to four feet into the soil with compaction so the heavier okay. equipment and like those 2000 bushel grain buggies yeah. should be left on the side of the field in the headlands. Yes. Yeah. And then now I even, the I've, yeah. I've also seen some farmers actually build essentially an approach like a graveled, they've actually just sacrificed the headlands and have made an approach and they can bring their trucks in and, and do it that way or, or leave the buggy there or whatever the case may be. Um, and just essentially, make that even better footing uh, for mm -hmm. loading and those sorts of things that's off the road. Um, but that, of course, if it's rented ground, you're not going to do that. So that's another consideration, but certainly have seen that as well. Now, John does, um, in our scenario, he said that they adopted the approach of drive the same track down the North Headland. And when the combine was full, because we couldn't make a full round, we come out to the approach on a different angle. So to me, John, that sounds like you did both. You drove the same track but also then came out at a different angle. Can you put up that photo that I sent? Sure. Jason, now is time for the photo. I think it's number four. Was it the fourth one or do you want to start with the first uh, one? All of them will show it. Okay. 
I like this. Also, apparently <laughs> right, I have to play a clip, but it's, come on. Okay. All right. What are we looking at? This looks fun. We are looking at soybeans and you can see old combine tracks. You can see the planter tracks. And if your wheel tracks are coming up um, greener than the rest of the field, I, I coined this term, you have fluffy soil syndrome. You have made it too fluffy with tillage and you needed actually some of that uh, compaction. So compaction or increasing bulk density isn't always bad, but if it's wet out there, it's always bad. It's always. Um, so this one is showing IDC, um, iron deficiency chlorosis. It's pretty bad in our area. And um, because you had that pressure in there, it, it works with the water and the nitrogen and it gives you less uh, uh, IDC issues. But if you go to the next one, and I go up every spring, they're there every spring. So the first field is wheat. Again, you can see all the places where he's tracked this. And I'm not even sure what he did because he's actually got parallel ones on that. He's not at an angle. I know quite a few of our guys will combine on an angle and till on an angle, but straight, uh, you know, that, that I don't usually see. And then the field behind again is soybeans. And then the next one, everything you do out there is wow. is shows up and and it shows up for a while so while you maybe messed it up one year you know you do have a, a combined effect out there as well and then the last one is your favorite one this is my favorite one everyone because it's just yeah. such a pretty pattern except <laughs> what the heck so what all happened here <laughs> That one, I actually don't know what they did because I'm in an airplane. And so I don't always know what, yeah. what fields I'm over and can't ground truth them. But um, silage also makes really pretty patterns too because they go out there and they turn around. So you have all these beautiful right. little swirls out there. Um, mm. But yeah, he, this, is, this is very normal. Um, you know, a lot of times farmers say, oh, it looks uneven. And then when it gets a little taller and from the road, you can't see past two rows of corn. You're like, oh, it evened up. My husband says that all the time. And he, <laughs> but you take, you take a drone up or you go up in an airplane, yeah. you say, no, it never caught up. It never caught up. So well, what's I, interesting yeah, so about that too, Jody, is that, it, you know, you see that's those symptoms this year. And then a couple of years later, they've disappeared. But then you have another tough year and like three or four years later, this same pattern can show up from that thing that you did four or five years ago. Yeah, uh, we actually have some research. Ward Voorhees is from Morris, Minnesota, and he is like the compaction guru. And I was so sad when he uh, retired. But he showed that a 20 ton, one time 20 ton axle load affected yield out to 12 years. Now, it was it was a 30 percent yield decrease the first year and within about five years it, it came up to normal non-compacted levels but then every year if it was too wet or too dry compaction showed its head again and it's like one more stressor on that plant so if you have timely rains and well-placed fertilizers you may not see the effects of compaction but you give it any stressor that plant any stressor and it it will definitely show Mm -hmm. Okay, so I have several things going on in the chat, but also I do want to go to our one clip. Um, except for Jody, I have to ask, so do you go up, do you fly the plane? Or do you no. have someone who takes you <laughs> up every year? Hey, I know, I'm always surprised by who I find out has Thank a pilot you, though. license. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Yeah. Yes. Okay. But I'm always no, surprised I have a... because, yeah, I think planes are magic and so I don't trust them, so I would never do it. So anyway, someone takes you up <laughs> and flies yeah, you around because... every year. To hold your phone outside the window is pretty, you know, uh, I can't be driving, oh flying and doing that at the same time. So and I'm like that. gripping it. Well, you could just, couldn't you just, I was going to say, couldn't you just use your knees? That's what I do when I'm driving and have to open my coffee. Anyway, just kidding, everyone, sort of. <laughs> okay, so I want to go to our, so our first clip, Jay, I think, it, I think it's our first clip, because we've started to talk a little bit about what is kind of summarized in this clip, and that is the yield loss sort of right off the hop. And then how that can sort of dissipate over time. Um, I think is that, or maybe that's our second one that's on the canola. That's the uh, NDSU one, I think, Jay. Let's maybe do the second one then. Sorry, I should have named them better for you. Jay's about to. 
One of the things that we know through research and um, just not in this region, but anywhere region in the world pretty much, is that if you have ruts that form, then you know you have deep soil compaction. And that is going to have some form of a yield consequence, not only for next year's crop, but also for the year after that. Most soil compaction issues, it's a multi-year recovery. So typically, no matter what the crop is, whether it's a small grain, large grain, um, if you have deep soil compaction from wheel traffic, you can anticipate probably anywhere from, on average, a 15 to 20 percent yield loss for that next one and two years uh, that's going to follow up afterwards. So long term, how long can these impacts stick around if producers aren't actually doing anything about compaction? So once the compaction initially happens, it's going to take a couple years to recover, almost no matter what you do. Um, because usually when you have ruts, the compaction extends down below what your tillage implements, typical tillage implements are going to be. And even if you have something like a deep ripper that can reach down uh, 16 to 24 inches or so, it's still highly unreliable with it actually getting the outcome that you want uh, for bringing yields back up. It's just not a reliable tool for deep compaction like that. So the first two years, almost anything you do, you know that you'll have a loss. So that's something that's, you know, unfortunate. We just don't have a useful tool at our, at our disposal to deal with it, but it's something to keep in mind for when you're going out on wet soils. The best way to prevent losses is to prevent the compaction occurring in the first place, other than relying on something to try to remediate that compaction. After that first two years, compaction consequences on yields usually lighten up. It's, it will go down to maybe uh, 10, 5 percent. It may disappear altogether. However, uh, one thing that we do notice in repeated trials of research is that even when the yields recover, on the years that you may hit excessive rains again or drought conditions, those compacted fields, it'll reemerge. You'll see another 5-7% drop in yields because of this longer term uh, uh, compaction issue that can actually extend well up to a decade. I think I've decided to coin compaction the sneakiest of the yield robbers. Um, because yeah. based on based on what you said, Jody, just before that clip and that clip, three, four, five years out even, if we have a stressful year, we could be losing yield to compaction and really not be putting our finger on that's why. Unless yes, yeah, and that's we, what he was right? he was referring to that um, research that I was too, that you know, within five years it was back up to normal. But then um, 1988, which was extremely dry here, uh, compaction lost about 15% again of yield. And then in 91 and 93, which were very wet years, it lost almost that amount too. So, and that was a one-time compaction. Mm -hmm. Which isn't normal, right? Like if I right. do it this year, I'd probably do it next year and the year after. So where's the chance for it to recover? So, yeah. and that, so that brings us to, so John, who thank you, John, for being our absolute example for the whole evening, apparently. So John's crop that, of course, that he said, okay, so we effed it up this fall. Excellent way to write that, John. How do I figure out the best way to mitigate <laughs> the compaction or fix, or fix ruts, right? So let's talk a little bit about, let's shift gears somewhat and talk a little bit about, yes, okay, we want to prevent doing it if we can. Or if we have to, how do we make it the least amount? But then once it happens, then what do we do? So can so in that scenario, how could Ian, how could John have mitigated the amount of compaction? Well, again, it depends. Where is he? Like here in Ontario, it depends on whether you're in snow belt country or not, whether or not you can wait till freeze up to get in there and, and go. And you know, I go up skiing every weekend and there's a, a big buggy sitting out in the field with a big tractor on it with about 300 acres of corn around it because it's in snow country and they couldn't get to it. 
We have other guys that went through Christmas in early January and waited for it to freeze up and, and took it off without much in the way of problems. But there are other guys that, that I work with on tough, tough soils who have spent you know a lifetime building really strong soil health and creating equipment that is you know a reasonable size with lots of rubber on it and i was out in their fields late this fall in the wet and you could see the mark of the tire but there was no depressions or ruts or anything so yeah it's tough it's really tough so jody it does bring me to there was also an earlier question about um roots living roots versus um so versus dead decaying roots does root structure have an impact on the amount we compact a soil so thinking about that cover crop scenario yeah so the main thing that i wanted to do to help keep a soil from being so affected by compaction is build soil structure so the health of the soil because those aggregates act like mini columns in the soil and they help hold up the weight of equipment the more tillage that you do, the more you break those apart, the deeper you're going to sink. So a lot of times when people sink to their ruts, it's usually to their uh, tillage depth, if not a little further. But, And then, um, and yeah, somebody asked what's in my, my mug. And I'm just going to pretend there's alcohol in there. So if I don't give a good answer, I have an excuse. But because <laughs> uh, I'm like losing I, well, my train I'm, of thought. Yes. And we're sponsored by uh -huh. Uh -huh. anyway. Uh -huh. okay. Yeah. So fizzy okay. water. So, okay. So yes. Yes. Okay. So for live roots, um, roots build structure. Uh, tillage always takes it away, and roots always build it. So if you can keep roots in there, that's awesome because they'll help um, make rebar in the soil, basically, and, and start holding things together. And the more tillage you do, you're just undoing all of that. Now, having residue on the surface too, especially a heavy case of residue like with corn, then you're looking at better uh, trafficability. And even with the, if you have good biomass for uh, cover crops, you would too. The problem with cover crops is it's so dependent on the, on the weather. I, it's so it's hard to even do research on because every year is so different. Yeah. But That's I love cover crops for breaking it up. It's yes. a little different in Ontario because we still have a significant acres of three crops. So that wheat comes off or the, the spring cereals come off. And so we can get, you know, really good cover crop growth where Jody's fighting. How do you have enough season when you're trying to get soybeans off and corn and then have enough growth, right, Jody? Yes. Mm -hmm. And then the other two crops, potatoes and sugar beets, mm -hmm. really oh. difficult to get in. <laughs> yeah. So, but I mean, yeah. they're delicious. So anyway, yeah. um, okay, so hang on, I want to go back to your fluffy soil syndrome. And then Peter Johnson, mm -hmm. who I don't know, he's some guy out of Ontario, he's got a question, but um, the, <laughs> the fluffy, the fluffy soil syndrome. So this is what, what does that mean? What is, or what's the mechanism that it, mm -hmm. it really means there's, there's not enough contact there with your soil. So right. what happens with fluffy soil syndrome? So, you know, we, we try to have our planters where they get good seed to soil contact, but it's also important to have good root to soil contact. And so when you go in there and till, and what I usually see in fluffy soils is it's a disc ripper of some sort, and they're pulling in about 12 inches. Um, and it's not the chisel plow, it's not even the moldboard plow. But what happens is when you till is you turn the soil and you introduce a lot of air. That's why it warms up so nice. And that's why we like tillage. And, but the problem is, is you're breaking apart structure and, in, and putting air into your soil instead. So what is the load bearing capacity of air? It's an easy one. Zero. Zero, yeah. You, air holds nothing, but our structure did. So you're replacing those and you, we're just trying to help people back off from that and keep building structure and do less tillage, less passes. And so when you have all that air, you know, roots don't, don't go through dry soil and they can't really grow through air. So you need that root to soil contact and the, it's too fluffy. They don't get it. They do better when so, you have some, when you smash it back down again. 
And so that. that's the tracks that you were <laughs> that we could see in those fields. The darker areas were actually yeah. because they were in the tracks, they actually received some compaction that got rid of that air. Okay, very cool. Uh okay, so Peter Johnson, Peter Wheat Pete Johnson, resident agronomist for realagriculture.com and former OMAFRA staffer, um, host of Wheat Pete's Word, all of those things. If all <laughs> this compaction is causing 10 to 20% yield loss, he argues, or at least five to ten. How is it yields keep going up, Ian McDonald? So um, I, I like this question because I think it's really important. Um, when you think of the last 10 years, if not the last 30 years, the new genetics that the seed companies have provided to the industry are phenomenal, right? When you look at those yield increases. Mm -hmm. The problem with that is that it hides our sins. And so if the yield potential is greater than the lot and so your soil health associated with the activities that we do, then you're going to see those yields continue to go up. But at some point, you're going to hit a wall and then you're beyond the point in which a recovery can happen in a reasonable time to not have that plateau of, of yield potential uh, messed up. Okay. Mm -hmm. I hope now, I hope Peter, that answers that question. It is a very good one. Um, and also he would like to know, does it make any difference if the combine is set to drive with tire on the row or between the corn rows? So this is thinking about that roots question. Can we, mm. so can we make a significant difference on compaction if we think about where we put our tires? Yeah. But you also eat up your tires really bad too. Exactly. What would you say? <laughs> yeah. so, you rubber's really expensive, you guys. <laughs> it's mm -hmm. really expensive. <laughs> and, and that uh, yeah. is improved. So riding on the corn row in in the ground that was not tilled or reduced tilled would be better than corn row where the ground was deeply cultivated in in preparing it for planting. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. I feel like we're we're around to an it depends. But anyway, yeah. um I digress. <laughs> no, there's, but this is there's this other is things that well, there's other things that they could do what that would have more of an impact than whether they're driving on the row or not. And that and and Ian definitely has showed this many, many times, is reducing your axle loads and getting larger tires out there and lower PSIs. Mm -hmm. Those are two things that they can control compared to the weather, which you can't. Right. And, and which John does mention, Ian, he's in Bruce County, more specifically Bruce Township. Um, so always an eye on the weather and says that realistically, uh, snow will set in anytime after November 1st and stay until March. So he's not leaving crop behind if he can help it. That's for sure. Um, the Manitoban and me still thinks that's a pretty short winter. So just putting that out there. Um, <laughs> so there you go. Now, Doug McComb, and I hope this is the Doug McComb that I think it is. And if it is, hello, Doug, welcome here. Um, if it's, if it's Doug from, from Quebec, let me know. Anyway. Um, okay. So is there data to suggest, this is a fascinating thought process. Um, if I plant earlier crop varieties that I can harvest earlier, and in turn, give me high yields for years to come because I've managed my compaction, but I've lost yield because I've chosen those shorter season, potentially varieties, so lower yield potential. Um, can you be ahead? So it, can you make that work in that soil is maybe more important than maximizing yields? And for sure, a dry fall I lose um, and wet fall I can win for many years if that's the case, right? So if it, if it does turn wet, you've damaged that, that field for quite some time. Interesting yeah. process. Jody, what do you think? Are, are we giving, is there any uh, research in this? Well, tell me the weather, I'll tell you how to farm. <laughs> um, because, Perfect, I'm writing that down. Yeah, I mean, that's something that you guys always have to make a balancing act of if you get out there when it's wet or dry. Now, the other thing uh, that somebody asked about erosion, well, there's something you can do that will help with erosion and compaction, and that's building soil health. I mean, I hate to just bang that one with a stick, but soil health can help you in so many different ways. So if you do take out that crop earlier and you put down a cover crop, you're being protected over the winter, so you shouldn't be getting all this snurt and everything. Um, and then it also helps build aggregation action issues. So mm -hmm. 
you know, short season crops to me are nice. Uh, if you got that chance, I mean, you don't have to make it like peas. We also have sweet peas and sweet corn here too, which are really short season and then they till and they leave it. So, but think about your soil is only covered for, from full canopy for about two months of the year. That's it. Mm -hmm. And the rest of the year, we leave that soil black or brown in your case. Ours is black, but ours is brown. Yeah. Okay. So, <laughs> so, but, and, and so then it would have to be part of a larger system where you would be putting something in either a fall forage or a cover at least, or, or something else so that you're at least keeping living roots and keeping canopy cover well, as well. And you wanted me to talk about cows. There's a perfect thing. And even sheep, somebody wants Thank sheep. You. I got even That's goats. Good. Peter, you got good fat. Yeah, so, <laughs> so Jody, I have a lot of sheep and Peter doesn't want me to talk about sheep. But if I had my druthers, <laughs> everyone would have sheep. So there you go. And we can get more. Um, and yes, Canadian cow mm -hmm. is out in the Fraser Valley. And um, I thought Ontario plowed a lot. But oh, goodness, out in the Fraser Valley, they have a lot of moisture this year notwithstanding but uh uh remind me i think they get at least four to five cuts or sorry five to six cuts of alfalfa mm -hmm. they use a lot of tillage mm -hmm. oh goodness anyway so there we go i don't know what you do in in um that scenario i don't know how you fix that <laughs> well it's even worse than the tillage in the forage stand especially in some place like the fraser valley with how much moisture there is that in, in all the work that we've done with field uh, uh, demonstrations of different types of equipment, uh, some of our forage equipment has been absolute worst because uh, those mm -hmm. harvesters are heavy. The mm -hmm. wagons that get filled is carrying a great deal of moisture back to the uh, silos and stuff. And all of that creates problems with compaction. So, you know, average, average person doesn't really think about compaction in forage stands, but it can be huge. In I've just realized how teeny tiny the tires are on silage wagons. Mm -hmm. they're, and they're I, it never, yeah, it, that I never really even thought about that, but they're teeny. Oh my goodness. Okay. You're right. Um, okay. And so Peter does want to note, Doug, uh, Ian's good friend, Rob T. I don't know who that is, Ian. You're supposed to know. Farms near Staffa. I know where that is. Mark Brock and Sandy Brock are there. I believe strongly in Doug's philosophy. His yields this year were very good compared to average in the area. So there you go. There's always someone who's doing something just like that. Okay, I like that. Um, this is really interesting. Okay, Ian, I wanna get into, um, we've got about 15 minutes left. Jay, remind me how long that clip is. We might just go, I know, hold on to your hats, everybody. We might skip one of the clips, which I usually do. Um, and um, if everybody had sheep, I would make no money. Peter, bite your tongue. I have, that is just, anyway. <sighs> the things I put up with. Um, okay, so so Ian, I do want to go to, I want to talk about the compaction events. I want to talk about some of the stuff that you did. Um, so we we do have some footage. If anyone wants to head over to realagriculture.com or to our YouTube channel, uh, you can go and see all the videos we've done on compaction and some of these compaction events. And they're so cool, really neat. But um, Ian, you did, uh, you do have a few more slides here and some discussion of some of the aha moment so let's maybe go through some of those and we'll just skip the clip for now i did want to mention though quickly tonight's show is brought to you by adama canada and real egg radio because i always forget to mention that so there i am mentioning it again okay ian let's talk us through some of what you learned this past year okay so this is uh, our site for the north american manure expo and this is a dual um tandem noon tanker it's got 30.5 lr32 so a radial tire and based on the weight and the tire on the road the pressure for that would be required by the tire manufacturer to be 28 psi that same weight in the field at um at field speed could be 16 psi and so you go well you know is that a big deal and uh, so let's show you go to the next slide jason so what we did this year that we hadn't done before is we did a wet pit and a dry pit. So if you look on the left-hand side, it's the, the data from the dry. On the left-hand side, on the top 
right corner, top left corner. The first two lines you see are the tractor tires, and then you see the first uh, wagon, and then the second wagon, first axle. And sorry, we didn't get the chart right. <clears throat> but so at that 28 PSI, you see how in the drier soil, the green line is lower than it is in the wet line. So shallow soil compaction. And again, this is pressure detected. This is not necessarily compaction. It's it's a, a, a proxy for compaction, right? So okay. under those wet soils, notice how there's significantly more pressure exerted at the six inch depth, which is what's represented by the green lines. <clears throat> the blue lines are the 12 inch uh sensors mm -hmm. and this is an interesting contrast and jody i'm going to send this to you so you can look at it and help me but notice that the blue lines in the drier soil are higher than the blue lines in the wetter soil and we're <laughs> supposing that this is because oh. the wet soil absorbs that stress and sort of dissipates it there and it doesn't get down to the deeper part which is sort of a quite an interesting <laughs> contrast relative to everything that we're thinking about but then look at the bottom two charts and that's the exact same outfit put across the same wet and dry pit at 16 psi and look at the reduction in the stress detected at those depths when you uh, have lower psi regardless of whether it's wet or dry but the best scenario is at low psi in drier soils and so those are sort of the, the findings that we were coming up with and uh, we're hoping to get that published on our field crop news site in the next few weeks once uh, Peter re reviews it to see whether it's satisfactory or not. Right, of course. He's a bit busy this week though I hear. Okay, so and this is where, right, this is where that the ease of which you can change tire pressure really comes into play. Correct. Yeah, because obviously, you'd, what is it? If it's fun, it gets done. If it's easy, just find something that rhymes with that. Anyway, if if it's if it's relatively hmm. fast, right? And and the click of a button, it works. It whatever we're gonna do it. But if it's time consuming and the whole bit, it's not likely to happen. Correct. So right. so Ian, would would you say like how has adoption been then on something like that? inflation technology? I mean, is it still quite rare? Are we seeing more pickup? So in Europe and Australia and places like that, it's amazing how it's being adopted. In Ontario, it's coming along because of the events that we've done. When we talk to our American counterparts like Jody and Scott Shear at Ohio State and others, they're quite, you know, they, they say the adoption is not very high. And, and we're trying to get more people in the US looking that way too, because we need the critical mass of farmers in North America to sort of get engaged, to sort of get the momentum going to have more of those systems deployed. Yeah, and we've done some research with the Precision Inflation one and the farmer, well, we put them on three different farm machines and one of them said, you know, he wasn't sure if he saw it quite kneeled, but he knew he could get out to the field a lot and do another pass before he got stuck. So that was right. a benefit. Yeah. That's something. I mean, we have to mm. use different measuring sticks, I suppose. So, okay, so it brings up, we obviously need a plan to try and mitigate and or reduce the amount of compaction we're doing. I mean, none would be great, but that's not necessarily plausible. Um, but as you said, we know that most of the compaction happens at first pass and we know that one compaction event can have long-term issues. So if we're in a scenario where we did make a mess last fall, which I think quite a few people are in, what would you tell someone or what are the things to do this coming year? Sort of where do you begin on that whole process of trying to fix what you got and reduce it going forward? Well, you don't need to rip the whole field if you just got ruts in certain areas. Um, because you remember your number one defense is, is the soil aggregates. And the more tillage you do the, and the deeper you try to go to, to get out deeper compaction, you're just going to make more of a mess and set you up for worse compaction later. So, Ian, do you want to 
add to that? I, I fully agree with that. I think you got to fix the ruts. So go out there and do as little as you can with the disc or shallow sea tine or something to, to get rid of those um, ruts because how else do you plant the next crop type of thing? And then do the deep ripping. And again, we're sort of blessed in Ontario with the wheat crop because we can then go out and do that when the ground is in better shape. It scares the life out of me to deep rip, rip in early spring or late fall. And it's the deep ripping to the tillage that problems that Jody talked about. The other problem is, is that when I deep rip, if I come back with another heavy implement on top of that, <laughs> I risk driving that compaction even deeper, right? So if I had to go mm -hmm. 16 inches this year, do I have to go 20 inches next year? Like, where does it end? Right. Mm. And also, um, um, yeah. oh, go ahead. No, no, go ahead. At sub oh, sorry. Uh, if you do that subsoiling when it's wet, you're going to create, especially in a clay soil, oh, you're going to create horrible, horrible problems. We have really nice soil pit pitchers where it's just smeared like butter and it, it just mm -hmm. fills up with water and the plant drowns out. So you can always do more tillage. You can't take away tillage. So I would go in there with the 30 inch shanks and just rip it once. The other thing is, is you don't need to get, have it at the factory setting of 20 inches. You can um, you find out where that compacted layer is. Uh, there's different kinds of compaction. So there's the wheel traffic compaction that is going to look like a U in the soil. And then there's the plow pan compaction. So if you're going in to rip up plow pans, you want to set the machine only an inch or two below it, um, no deeper, because if you are ruining structure down to 20 inches, like Ian said, now you're going to drive on it again and you can now sink to 20 inches and, and create a very right. deep compaction problem. But if you if you look at some of Jody's pictures from early on and going to what Aaron was talking about in that first clip, you don't have to have ruts visible to have soil compaction happening deeper down because soil compaction deeper right. down is a function of total axle weight, not so much the, the footprint and the tire pressure. The, the, okay, so that's, that was actually, that's my next question, um, is what tools should we be using if we suspect potentially that, so as I said, it's a sneaky yield robber. So if you're trying to figure out some of these things, you're trying to get a sense of, of how big of an issue you might be dealing with potentially, uh, you know, should we be out there trying to find some of these compaction layers and, and do some comparisons? My comment is yes. And you need a tile probe or something like that. And you need to have the patience to walk around the field and look for it. Everybody wants to go to the easy solution, which would be the yield map. But think about how compaction happens. It happens in relatively narrow rows and we harvest in big, wide swaths so the actual impact of the compaction gets diluted by the harvest it's really tough to determine the absolute value of, of compaction loss associated with the way we harvest um yeah it, it's tough it's really tough so some of it is is just just got to have the faith and the understanding of the the science and the way soils and crops interact it also sounds like a lot of time I'm just saying, <laughs> I mean, uh, I would be curious, but there's a reason that researchers go out and do these things because we all have a lot of other things going on, like growing the yeah. crop and spraying the crop and all those decisions that have to be made. Um, so the keep, question, in mind, though, to interrupt, keep in mind yeah, that no. it's extremely hard to do compaction research to replicate in a plot the types ah. of traffic and activity that happens at a farm scale level right and right. it's really tough yeah um somebody was asking about using the shanks the straight shanks in dry soil and or frozen yeah. soil Fro frozen yeah. soil can work as long as nothing heats up but um dry soil yeah but each one of those shanks will take 50 to well 30 to 50 horsepower and one guy was even getting up to 60 horsepower per shank to pull it through a dry soil so again right. you don't want to drag it at 20 inches um yeah, I mean, combining when it's frozen, we do that in North Dakota and Minnesota. It, sometimes yeah, but, you have to wait. Well, I was going to say till October and then it happens and then wait. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> 
I mean, I'm sort of. Sometimes kidding. it um, doesn't yeah. freeze until November. Uh, so. Yes, that's right. Sometimes. No. So, but it is, it is a good point as to when, of course, when you should do these things. And, and as we've covered that, if you're going to, and that it doesn't have to be the whole field. So it might just be that one track or that one where you drove the silage wagons or where you drove the buggy mm -hmm. or whatever. It doesn't. And diesel is expensive, everyone, and your time is worth something. So make sure you're doing what I think we used the term the other week, strategic and intentional tillage. Mm -hmm. so that was our that was our discussion. Right. Um, yeah. And yeah. And so John saying, though, that if I have to harvest in subpar conditions, the best approach would be to keep everything in one track. Again, we're generalizing. I know it depends. I Ian. like it. Yeah. <laughs> so, okay. So Jody is a thumbs up. Ian, you're mm -hmm. a, eh, not so sure. If it's subpar. Just, again, it depends on how big is your buggy and how much rubber is underneath it, right? Yeah. If you, if, you know, like one of our best farmers here, you know, his, his mantra is, I buy the smallest buggy of the biggest chassis uh, configuration so that configuration. Right. I've got as much rubber as I can get, but they can't, my guys can't overload it. Overload it. Yeah. Yeah. But the problem is so many things are getting bigger and bigger and they're not putting on larger tires. Agreed. And yes. yeah. Yeah. And uh, so you need more axles. If you can do that, like the way wagons, the little, little buggies would you call them i don't know um uh, with the little skinny tires and stuff it's like oh get the larger tires out there get another axle if you can um tracks are not a panaceum they will let you get further into the field before you get stuck right well, and the thing and they, why, and they, we have manure spreaders with look multiple good. axles and we only right. have grain buggies grain carts with single axles it makes no sense i know yeah, exactly. Okay, so, so why do you think that is? To me, that seems like that's sort of a legacy issue. Um, maybe not issue is the right word, but that is just sort of a, right? Like, is it that we just assume, well, that had to go on the road, so it got another axle, or maybe because it's liquid? Like, why do you think we, we've we engineered? Really? That's Well, yeah, I mean, yeah because the... cause manure is worth more than corn? Come on now. Not this year. Well, maybe, actually. But fertilizer. You put out... <laughs> You put out manure all year round. And so I think I hear a lot of farmers complaining about the compaction that the honey wagons have. And and maybe and we assume that our falls are going to be dry. So, you know, and that's not happening mm, anymore. Yeah. So, that's yeah, I would love to see them. Manure, yeah, manure spreaders them. tend to spend more huh. time on the road, which is why they've yes. gone to more access to support that weight. Right. The grain buggy. Right grain cart, sorry, sits in the field most of the time, not really on the road yeah. loaded at speed. Um, so that's part of the difference, but we need to look at more rubber under stuff. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. and precision inflation. Get yeah. that out in the field. Well, except in a, in a grain cart, you really don't need it <laughs> because if you're if you're not running it on the road full, then you can leave you're it at the lower it. tire yeah. pressure. Just leave it True. at the lower, yeah. And mm -hmm. and so Peter's saying so more buggies is better than one bigger buggy. Okay. Yeah, but then you need okay. Except manpower um, and time. I was going to say, but then you need people, and then you. Yep. But we're we're trying to save the soil. Darn it! So we're just going to do what oh. it takes. Yes, go ahead. One more, one more quick thing. Yes. The biggest myth out there is that uh, free saw takes care of compaction, <gasps> and it does that not. Be, yes, oh, Jody, it's like yeah. you're reading my mind. So I am. and this one gets yes, this one gets challenged a lot. I find more so in Ontario. And I do recognize that certainly there are areas of, of Ontario that will get several freeze thaw cycles in at least the, mm -hmm. the topsoil, right? But yeah. I'm so it helps yeah, here. Right. Here. But that's just it, is we're talking about potentially 20, 30 inches, centimeters, whatever that is. Um, it's not gonna have an impact down there because all that depth isn't going to go through a freeze thaw cycle more than right. once. And you need right? multiple freeze thaw cycles to break that up. Right. So well, and even down shallow. Deep. Yeah. If you don't, mm -hmm. if you have snow before it really freezes, you've got that insulation. You're not going to get that freeze right. thaw even in the shallow depth. Yeah. Right. And if it's dry, you won't either. It's the wet, wet, you know, crystals it's freezing that will right. help pop it. Yeah. yeah. 
Yes. So don't so rely on it. And the reason why it probably did happen a while ago is because we had lighter equipment and, you know, we had more crops in our rotation. We had manures and compaction stayed a little lighter, you know, uh, shallower in the soil. Yeah, that was actually one of my questions that I had because it always gets challenged. We've had a few people on to talk compaction and talk about ruts and talk about all these things. And and it, it really is a tough one to say, no, you know, winter takes care of some of these issues. But I think maybe winter just makes us forget sometimes. Um, Wetting and, and drying. And it, if your soil uh, cracks it, in the summer, yeah, that's, that's tillage. Uh, interesting. Right. That is a physical separating mm -hmm. of of the soil and coming back together um but not but that also sometimes is because it's very dry so yeah. it's a silver <laughs> lining to right yeah. let's put it yeah um when last summer people could lose whole uh Pete, peter makes the comment back. there about the uh, about the road speed in the field right but it's yes it's the friction is a function of the problem on the road with the weight you have that weight on soil and you're not getting the same amount of friction per mile per hour that you're getting on the pavement and so you can mm -hmm. get away with those lower pressures mm -hmm. and he does say there's wet dry in the spring in ontario and yes so there are wet and dry cycles that we can dry out and re-wet and dry out but we're not necessarily we shouldn't be depending on those freeze thaw cycles to fix anything right all that far down um, yeah, just so wetting and drying that. do a lot more than freezing and thawing. Right. And it is remarkable how much a soil can shift from wetting and drying, depending on the type of soil. Mm -hmm. Certainly some of those clays is pretty, pretty amazing to see. Um, mm -hmm. This, this has been absolutely fantastic and we are running out of time. Um, I want to thank both of you so much for this evening, for sharing your knowledge, for sharing your photos. I have so many new terms already, like, fluffy soil syndrome mm -hmm. i don't know what i'm going to do with that but i'm going to do something with <laughs> it i'm telling you that right now um so <laughs> this is um yes peter my hair is curly like sheep wool because i have to everything in my life revolves around sheep anyway thanks peter he you can tell he's hitting the road he's got he's got a spring in his step he's excited to see yeah. humans again so so it's good all right um so thank you ian thank you jody this has been absolutely fantastic thank you everyone who is here and in the comments if you have any follow-up questions anything uh for experts or if you've got an idea for a topic or an expert you'd like to see on the show uh just zip me an email lsmith at realagriculture.com and remember head over to realagriculture.com slash agronomist for your cu credits next week everyone super important February 14th. It's Monday. It's Valentine's Day. So A, don't forget that. I'm frozen. That's awesome. Um, and But we're also going to have Dale Cowan and John Hurd are going to join me for a talk about the most romantic of the elements, uh, that is nitrogen. And we are going to talk about the most economical rate of nitrogen for this coming year. And it is going to be a lively one, let me tell you. So again, uh, thanks to our show sponsor, to Adama Canada to Real Ag Radio and to Mind Your Farm Business for making this all happen. And we'll see you next week. Cheers, everybody. <laughs>